Good afternoon, everybody. Come on in from the lobby. We're going to continue our conversations with the candidates. My name is Judith LeBlanc. I'm Caddo from Oklahoma. My formative linguistic years were in Boston, so don't mock me. I am the director of the Native Organizers Alliance, and we are a proud co-host with Four Directions of the Frank Lemire President, Native Presidential Forum. I, I, am, uh, I have been asked to introduce our next candidate, whom we will spend some time talking with. His name is Congressman John Delaney. Yes, you can clap. He served six years in the House of Representatives, representing the 6th Congressional District of Maryland. He was the first candidate to declare, and as we know, many followed, right? He also has visited 99 counties of Iowa. And now he's in, he's in the Indian country county. So please give a warm welcome to Congressman John Delaney. Thank you, George. Thank you for escorting me out. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Nice to see you, sir. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, sir. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> so it's great to be with you this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to spend too much time because I think the most important aspect of a forum like this, a presidential forum, is to actually have the skilled moderators ask me tough questions and let me answer them. But I do want to thank you all for having me and thank you for convening this forum, which I think is very, very important that we have a forum dedicated to the issues and concerns and, by the way, opportunities of our Native American communities in, and indigenous people. And I think it's extraordinary that you decided to do this and that your voices will be heard in this presidential election. Because to some extent, I think the 2020 election, and I apologize, but I've <clears throat> been losing my voice. As I said, I lost it in New Hampshire and I'm finding it here in Iowa. Uh, so it's coming back a little bit, but it breaks from time to time. Um, this presidential election, I th in my judgment, is in many ways about the candidate that can actually hear many voices, many of which have very unique concerns and issues that are affecting them or their communities, and how they can take those voices and concerns, make sure they are part of the platform for my party going forward, but also do it in a way that is appealing to all Americans. So we have to have a message of common purpose as a nation, but it also has to be respectful of issues and concerns that individual Americans have based on their own unique perspectives and experiences. And that's what I believe having presidential forums like this is really about at the end of the day, is making sure your voices are heard, making sure the candidates who are running for the privilege of being the president of the United States understand and appreciate these concerns and make them part of their commitment to you going forward. And obviously as it relates to our Native American communities and nations and indigenous people generally in this country, there are very, very, very significant issues and concerns. On issue after issue, whether it be health care, whether it be housing, whether it be criminal justice, whether it be education, on all those important institutions in our society, we see outcomes as it relates to the Native American community that are far lagging other communities in this country. And that has to stop. And the way it stops is by having leaders who are committed not just to your sovereignty as a people, but also committed to honoring the, of the obligations of the United States of America, 
which are significant and which we haven't done a very good job at across time, but also committed to rebuilding these institutions, each one of them, healthcare, education, criminal justice, housing, small business opportunities, rebuilding these institutions so that we fundamentally get different outcomes in the future, so that the unemployment rate isn't dramatically higher among our Native American communities, so that affordable housing isn't a crisis, so that the, your schools aren't falling down and collapsing, and in many ways almost inoculable by the students, right? And that the most important issue, which is the amount of violence that we see against women in Native American communities, which is so appalling when you look at the statistics and you compare it to the rest of the population in general, that we actually end that. These are the commitments that I believe you need from someone who wants to be the President of the United States. And I plan on making those commitments to you here this afternoon. And with that, I think I'll turn it over if you, if you all think it's okay for us to get started now. I'm not sure. I assume this is for me. Yes. Got Thank it. You. I'll go where I'm told. Thank you. <laughs> we'll begin with a question from our elder, Marcella. LeBeau. Thank you. One of the things uh, I'm concerned about is back home on the Cheyenne River Reservation. I believe that there is a pervasive sadness that exists there because of unresolved grief. And back in 1890, the massacre at Wounded Knee, there were innocent women and children who were killed there by the 7th Cavalry. And even Bigfoot, who was the leader, he laid there with pneumonia. He was ill, unarmed, under a fl white flag of truce. He was killed by the 7th Cavalry. And then 20 medals of honor were awarded to these soldiers. And over the years, our tribe has sent in resolutions to revoke those medals of honor. So far, nothing has been done. And we understood at one time that the War Department refused to open the records to even take a look at it. So over the years, we've, this has been a problem for us. So there's a bill now before Congress. And so my question is, Will you support the removal of the STAIN Act, which is called? So thank you for the question and for bringing up that very important issue. And you framed it around the despair in your community. And I thought that was a very appropriate way to, to actually start the question. Because there's a long shadow that continues across time based on certain actions. And it's incredibly important to ultimately have some form of reconciliation or resolution to actually start getting out from under the shadow. And obviously what happened, the word massacre is the best way to describe that uh, incident, right? The, the number of innocent women and children who were killed in that battle uh, is stunning. When you, what's that? It wasn't a battle. It wasn't a battle. I'm sorry, in, in the incident, it wasn't a battle. <clears throat> the number of women and children that were, that were uh, killed and massacred in that situation that you described uh, is appalling. And I think Congress was right when it apologized and when we actually gave a formal apology. But more needs to be done. And the legislation that you're referring to was sponsored actually by a good friend of mine who I came into Congress with. And as president, if that legislation comes to my desk, I'll sign it. Uh, I haven't gone through the legislation specifically or the specific situations. So I'm assuming that the people referenced, and this is always a very difficult issue, which is what you do with medals as we look back over time and, and have different standards and apply different things. And I think it's incredibly important that each one of those situations be looked at because there's families and there's stories associated with these things. Uh, and I'd wanna do that before I would commit to this specific situation and the specific individuals. 
So I can't say right now because I haven't gone through the 20 stories and the 20 situations. But in general, what happened that, in that incident and the effect and the long shadow it continues to, to cast, I think we should be doing everything we can as, as a country to allow that despair uh, to start being lifted. And if that involves going through those specific records and making changes to those medals, that's something I'm amenable to do. So thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Snuffy Maine. Grove on. Testing. How? <laughs> My name is uh, Snuffy Maine. Some people call me William. Others call me that old aimster, the rabble rouser, among other things. I am a member of the Grovant tribe of Montana, a name given us by the white man. We call ourselves Aaninin, or white clay people. Most of you have probably never heard of the Grovant, and for good reason. We were nearly exterminated. For a better idea of who we are, the Grovant and the Arapaho were once one tribe. The Grovant currently share the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation, Montana, with the Assiniboine tribe. First of all, I would like to thank all involved for our organizing and helping with this historic event. It is awesome. I would also like to acknowledge Frank Lemire and the many other Native American leaders who have fought so hard and sacrificed so much for their people before going to the other side. And the ones that are continuing with that legacy, the dedication is admired. I would like to thank Representative Delaney for agreeing to participate today. It is an honor to be here with my question for you. I was told I could use two minutes of time to give some background leading up to my question. So I will give a brief history of the first century of the Grovant tribe's dealings with the white man. When the new people began to come into our lands all those years ago, my tribe, the Grovant, along with our allies, the Blackfeet tribes, were viewed as an insurmountable obstacle for further exploration into our, territory, into our vast territory. Shortly thereafter, a smallpox epidemic wiped out two-thirds of our tribe. A coincidence? I think not. Due to the decline in our numbers caused by smallpox, or as our people call it, the disease, and the fur trading companies arming other tribes to fight against us, we were pushed into the southwestern part of our original territory, which later became the state of Montana. However, before leaving the northern part of our territory, which is now on the Canadian side of the border, we burned several forts and trading posts in retaliation for the companies arming other tribes to fight us. For this, we were labeled as bloodthirsty, and the extermination of our tribe began mostly through smallpox. So as with other many, oh, excuse me, so as with many other Native Americans, we should not even be here today, but our ancestors were resilient and had the strength to endure. Pages are stuck together, excuse me. Control, control of our original territory was dramatically reduced, and in 1855, the United States government approached us with an offer to enter into a friendship treaty. Under this friendship treaty, we and the United States promised to live together in peace and harmony for 99 years. We assumed that the treaties you signed with us would lead to that. But no, just a few years later, 
the United States broke their promise. After several failed attempts at entering more treaties and several more smallpox outbreaks, the Grovant in November of 19, or 1869 had one final bout with the disease. Among other things, a military report described the situation in the Grovant camp partially like this. And I quote, what is happening in the Grovant camp would make even the strongest hearted man cry. More of these people are dying by their own hand than from the disease itself. Less than 300 souls survived. They claim to have been intentionally given the disease. After this bout, the tribe was devastated, and not long after, the government funded missionaries to come in and make white men out of the Indians. Something similar to this happened to many tribes in this country. I can go on and on about more recent atrocities, but we have time constraints. So, Mr. Delaney, I have a question that relates to Native American history and the cultural genocide which we as Native Americans are still recovering from. I believe now the relationship between Native Americans and the United States has to heal. For that to happen, the United States must acknowledge and apologize for the terrible things that have been done to Native people. With all the recent public discussion about whether Reparations should be paid to Afri Amer African Americans for the atrocity of slavery. Do you think it would be appropriate for the United States to make an unequivocal gesture to Native American, or excuse me, an equivalent gesture to na the Native American community? Are you willing to acknowledge the massacres, sacred sites destruction, economic devastation, and more, and make that apology? At a minimum, would you support a public apology from the United States to Native Americans? Thank you. Let me start by thanking you for sharing that story uh, and the detail you provided me. And while I wasn't aware of the specific facts around that story, we know that stories like this and others where there were, whether it's from the Indian Removal Act or other things that occurred across time, don't reflect the values that we should have as a country and as a society. And I think <clears throat> the federal government being in a position to acknowledge that things happened and that we have to continuing to continue to work to improve the standards of Native Americans and indigenous people in our country is an incredibly important thing that we do. And I'm committed to doing that as president. I think that's the best thing that we can do as a nation to move forward and have the kind of reconciliation and healing that we're doing. When I look at the conditions that are occurring among Native American communities, nations, and indigenous people generally as it relates to the basic dignities that I think a human being should have as it relates to health care, as it relates to the opportunity for good education, as it relates to the opportunity to earn a living and support themselves, as it relates to cr the criminal justice system, and as it relates particularly with respect to being the victim of violence, I think there's an enormous amount of work for, we, for us to do. And I think that's the most important thing for us to focus on going forward. Thank you, sir. The United States has only issued five official apologies. Would you support an apology to Native Americans? There, there's nothing about me 
that would not have supported an apology to Native Americans for things that have happened, I, I don't have a full sense as to the implications of what, the, what it means specifically. So I don't like answering questions that I haven't actually fully thought through. I think there's clearly specific things that we've done that we need. We just talked about the incident at Wounded Knee where we actually gave a specific formal congressional apology. So I am supportive of that. And I think depending upon the situation, that should be something that the United States deems appropriate. But I think of it more in the context of these individual situations than the context of, of uh, a, a general apology. Our next question comes from Victoria Kitchion from uh, Winnebago. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Victoria Kitchion. I'm a tribal council member for the Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska. I'm also the chair of the National Indian Health Board and the chair of the Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Tribal Advisory Committee. So um, um, I'm up here. Um, I'm thankful for this opportunity and the Frank Lermier family for um, honoring this event with um, Frank's present and his his lifetime of, of civil duty to um, tribal people and, and the issues that we all encounter in our daily lives. So I want to say that to begin with and thank you for participating. Um, I, I wanted to say that I, I serve on the National Indian Health Board as well as STAC because those are some of the, the vehicles for change and government to government conversations. and. When we talk about the trust responsibility, that's the ground that we stand on and the native land that, um, that we have um, shared with um, the citizens of this country. And so in order for native people to achieve full health, we need a president who recognizes that distinct political relationship with the American Indians, Alaska natives, and that would honor that relationship. And what that looks like um, for tribal sovereignty is a permanent relationship with the federal government that is not um, passed over to the states. And things such as black block grants are no grants to tribal nations. And we have, we're consistently left out of funding and opportunities that are afforded to, um, to American citizens. And we're the first American citizens. And things such as, um, the greatest disparities, the greatest um, per capita level of disease, such as um, diabetes, um, obesity, alcoholism, suicide, and these things that plague our communities, uh, uh, HIV, we're not even eligible for the funding such as the uh, Ryan White Act. And these diseases touch our borders, yet we have no funding or support to combat those uh, illnesses. So. I, I, I want to talk about um, what you will do to fight for us and, and form policy uh, and walk with us hand in hand because we are a tribal nation and we know what is best for our communities. And the time for this, uh, this government uh, ward relationship, you know, that time has passed. And so that additionally means turning away from this piecemeal um, healthcare system that we have. You know, it's comparable to third world healthcare. And I'll use my tribe as an example. The Winnebago tribe, uh, the Winnebago Reservation uh, once had an Indian Health Service um, hospital that was the only federally healthcare system ever to lose its CMS certification. And as a healthcare professional, you understand the quality of care that must have not existed to, for something like that to happen. For the sister agency to say no more, and so that's just um, some information to, to uh, paint a, a grim picture of the, the inequity in, in the healthcare delivery that has um, brought us to this point. And our systems and public health infrastructure continue to be grossly underfunded under this, uh, this system. So we need a president that will fully embrace the trust responsibility and, and, um, and really mean it. We hear a lot of um, jargon, we hear a lot of willingness, but we, we are not seeing the solutions. And we have things in meetings with tribal nations, tribal leaders, with, um, for example, the House Budget Committee, and we have um, top advisors saying things uh, like, oh, everybody, uh, every special interest group wants their, their things funded. 
And so make no mistake that we are not a special interest group. We are distinct uh, sovereign nations with political distinct status. And that needs to be continued to honored and recognized by yourself, sir. So, so with that, our, expe our expectation is that as president, you will stand on that trust responsibility and the United States to the native nations. And I understand you have enjoyed a very successful career in healthcare industry, making resources available to uh, small healthcare systems. And I'm really interested on how you will use this level of expertise and the subject matter uh, expertise that you will bring to work with the tribes and Indian country. And how will you use that expertise to build, create, and sustain systems and public health infrastructure that will provide high quality care to the future generations of the American Indian Alaska Natives? Well, thank you for the question. And um, I think health care is one of the most important issues for us to not only talk about generally in this next uh, presidential campaign, because it's the number one issue affecting the American people. But as it relates to your community and your nations, it is the area where I think the outcomes have really been appalling. Because I think the amount of funding you received is dramatically less than other federal programs for healthcare. And when we talk about healthcare in this country, too much of the conversation is about access to health care, which is incredibly important because I think everyone should have access to health care because I think it's a basic human right. But the quality of health care is also very important. And we can't create a system that, yes, technically creates universal access, but has just terrible quality outcomes. And I believe that's the system we've created for the Native American communities and tribes and nations in this country. And so one of the things I'm committed to do as president is reforming that system. It does start with recognizing the sovereignty, but it also actually starts with having a real plan for how you improve health care. And I have a plan, it's called Better Care, <clears throat> that creates a form of universal health care system in this country that everyone would get as a basic human right. <clears throat> and it would be funded sufficiently to get rid of a lot of the funding disparities that exist in your communities and in many ways in Medicaid populations around this country and actually provide a basic set of federally funded health care uh, rights. <clears throat> and sometimes that would be implemented through a, a system where clinics and physicians and hospitals are actually part of the system, depending upon whether that's the right answer for that community, or sometimes it would be administered through an open system where people could go to providers. But I would want the, the, the national universal healthcare system that I build for all the citizens of this country to be available to your community, because I think it would be a better option than what you have now. Now, there are, are alternatives for achieving that, which is to allow it to continue to be an independent separate system and funding it at sufficient levels. I think either of those are potentially good options for improving the quality of the uh, Indian healthcare system. Um, sir, I just have to respond. That would not work for Indian country universal health care. We are a distinct political nation. And please just put that out of your mind on a solution for Indian country. But, but as I said, I think there would be an option available where people would, where if it was the right thing for a community, then they could use the federal universal health care system. That might be the right answer for certain communities or certain people. And I'm open-minded to that. If, if that's not what communities want, if that's what independent sovereign nations, if that's what they don't want, they don't have to take it. But, and if they choose not to, I think we should fund the system sufficiently to make sure we have good health care outcomes. I, I think that's, that um, would be more uh, acceptable to the tribes, and um, having us have access to a universal health care system is another afterthought. And I just, I really um, encourage you to um, um, continue to um, outreach with Indian countries such as um, NCEI, NIHB, and other Indian organizations um, that can really um, help you understand the 
the needs and solutions that we've come up with by the, the issues and challenges that we see in our remote native communities. And I also encourage you to visit an uh, Indian reservation and, and you will really um, be able to gain some um, perspective on, on those solutions. And, and, and I, I respectfully accept that. I, I just want to make sure I, I'm very clear in how I framed my initial answer to your question, which I just reiterated, which I viewed it as an option. The nice thing about an option is people can choose not to accept the option, and that's fine. I just think that it's always good to have the option because for certain people or certain communities at a moment in time, that might be a better alternative. But that doesn't, in my judgment, relieve the federal government of its obligation to ensure that communities have high quality health care. Our next question comes from Jason Cook from Yankton Sioux. Good afternoon. Um, my questions on consultation and appointments. President Clinton held the first White House Tribal Nations Conference during the administration. His administration and President Obama reinvigorated efforts to engage the tribal nations through annual White House Tribal Nation Conferences, consultations with tribal leaders, listening sessions across the country, and trips in, to Indian country meet with tribal leaders and tribal youth. Will your administration host the White House Nations Conference, and how do you plan to engage tribal leaders on issues impacting their nations? Yes, my administration will do that, and I commit to do that within the first six months of my administration. Um, because I think it's important. And I think there's an enormous power associated with convening these type of conferences because you not only shine a spotlight on the issues, which is what you're doing here. With your presidential forum, you are shining a spotlight on important issues. There are television cameras here. We're talking about these issues in front of a much broader audience than even in the room here today. And that's the important power of convening. And I think the President of the United States has more convening power than anyone in the world, and using that convening power to assemble tribal leaders, elders, members of the community to have the same conversation we're having here today and make sure there's actionable results that come from it. So when we talk about a range of issues, whether it be health care, whether it be housing, whether it be criminal justice, whether it be what's happening with violence against women, whether it's be the fact that it's very hard for small business owners to get credit to grow their business, whatever the issue it is, big or small, that when you convene a conference, you typically end, if you're doing it right, and I plan on doing the conferences correctly, you end with an action items, where we say these are things we've agreed are priorities, and these are things we've agreed that we're gonna do after this conference is over. And then when you have the next conference, you start that conference by saying, how did we do against the things we said we were gonna do? And you create that kind of continuity where these issues um, and concerns aren't marginalized, but they're part of the dialogue, and there will be individuals in my administration responsible for the follow-up on them. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kiki Carroll from United South and Eastern Tribes. Good afternoon, Congressman. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Uh, during your opening comments, you made a few remarks, uh, one which was that the United States um, has not fulfilled its obligations. Uh, the second one is a value statement. Um, and within that space, the budget of the president is a value statement about what the president's priorities are for the country. In 2018, with the release of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights Broken Promises Report, uh, which was an update to the 2003 Quiet Crisis Report, it once again highlighted the failures of the United States to honor and fulfill its trust and treat obligations to any country. These failures are directly attributable to many of the challenges that Indian country faces. Specifically, these failures are a factor in the many socio, economic, and health disparities that exist in Indian country today. Uh, further, the Office of Management and Budget, which would report directly to you, uh, has recently been reporting to Congress that it appropriates roughly $21.5 billion on an annual basis to Indian country in fulfillment of its trust and treaty obligations. Uh, we dispute that figure 
uh, because we know it includes dollars that tribal nations are eligible for, but never actually receive or access for a variety of reasons. But regardless, even if that $21.5 billion figure were accurate, it reflects less than one half of 1% of the overall fiscal year 19 US budget. So my question to you, Congressman, recognizing the continued failures as outlined in the 2018 Broken Promises Report, and the fact that much of the power and wealth of the United States today is generated from the very lands and natural resources that once belonged to us. What steps would you take as president to ensure the fulfillment and promises, that fulfillment of promises and commitments made to America's first people is a priority, including and leading with full mandatory and advanced appropriations for all Indian country funding? Well, thank you for the question. I've always believed that, um, and Speaker Pelosi always frames uh, issues this way, where she says, show me your budget and I'll know your values. And I think that's what you're getting at. And we just talked about health care. The estimates that I've seen, for example, if we were to actually invest in that your health care system to get it up to the levels to be on parity with what people would expect from what would be considered good health care outcomes, would almost double that number on an annual basis. I mean, I have seen estimates that indicate to me there's a $20 billion a year shortfall in health care alone. So the way I think about it is, is as follows. What's important is not necessarily what the percentage of the budget is. What's important is what are the programs that need to be funded to fulfill our obligations and to ensure that basic individual dignity is being met. And we have to fund those priorities appropriately, whether it be health care, whether it be education, whether it be housing. And that's how we have to think about it. We can't think of it as a kind of a top-down number where we pick a number, 20 billion or 30 billion or 40 billion. But we actually look at the programs and we figure out what levels of fundings are required to actually start changing some of these outcomes. And that's where you start beginning your budget discussions. That's how I would think about that. Our next question is from Lisa Whitepipe Rosebud. Chante Washte Nape Chuzapi, Lisa Whitepipe Machiapi. My name is Lisa Whitepipe, and I am a council representative from the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. And it's an honor to sit on this panel today, and thank you for accepting us uh, to be here today. Congressman Delaney. Uh, my question is about the opioid crisis. Since the opioid crisis began, American Indians have experienced a five-fold increase in deaths by overdose, and families have been greatly impacted by the op opioid use. In recent years, several tribes have filed lawsuits against opioid, opioid manufacturers and distributors for their role in creating and perpetuating the epidemic including the Rosewood Sioux Tribe, the Flandreau Sioux Tribe, the Sisseton Wapaton Sioux Tribe, the Cherokee Nation, and the Navajo Nation. Um, tribal citizens suffer at the hands of pharmaceutical companies and fighting the epidemic causes financial strain for tribal governments. Um, when you are president, what is your plan to fight the op opioid epidemic? And how will you ensure that tribes have the financial resources they need to take on the crisis? It's a great question, and you know, the opioid crisis is something that's happening all around this country that doesn't nearly get the attention it deserves. It's estimated that 70,000 lives were lost in our country last year from opioid overdoses, which to put it into perspective is the equivalent of a Vietnam every year in terms of the number of lives that are lost. And this is destroying communities all over this country, all over this country. And Lots of factors contributed to it. But there's no question, in my opinion, that the pharmaceutical manufacturers and the distributors who are engaged in opioid manufacturing and distribution are culpable and need to be held liable for the destruction of human life and the havoc they've caused in communities all across this country. There, there is almost no argument against that. If you actually look at 
the practices which are now finally being reported upon, the aggressive sales tech, uh, techniques that were employed, the predatory marketing practices that were deployed. It's just, it's just a tragedy of enormous proportions. And it has to be dealt with. It has to be dealt with in your communities, in your tribes, but it has to be dealt with all across this country. It starts by making sure these pharmaceutical companies are held accountable, full stop. And that's why I support all of these legal actions that are being taken against this, these companies. And I hope they result in enormous judgments uh, and, and start providing some compensation for the individuals and the communities and the families that have been affected by this. But we also have to realize uh, as a country that we have an obligation to actually co be combating this in the streets where it's happening. And when you go around this country, like I have, you, you've actually see in individual communities programs that are working. And you see different programs in different communities that are working depends, depending upon the specific needs of those communities in terms of how care is delivered, in terms of how mental health care, because underlying this crisis is an enormous mental health crisis in this country, which I think you can link to so many other issues in our nation, including uh, the opioid epidemic. So it's ultimately going to take very significant financial resources provided by the federal government to communities, to health systems, to providers, to nonprofits that are actually on the front lines combating this uh, issue. And I've looked at numbers up to $100 billion over 10 years that have to be spent to actually address this crisis. And as president, I'm committed to ending this crisis. But we have to also address the underlying drivers of the crisis. So if you put aside the bad actions by the pharmaceutical companies and the drug distribution companies, because they worked hand in hand, and by the way, they knew exactly what they were doing. These companies monitor data every five minutes. They knew that in certain communities in this country, the number of opioids that were sold over a five-year period increased 28-fold. They saw those numbers coming in. They knew what was going on. So putting aside the, the culpability there and the liability there, which I fully intend to pursue so that we don't end this crisis with a bunch of people not going to jail and not paying fines, because there were bad acts that happened that created this crisis. But we also have to get it the conditions that allowed it to grow so dramatically and spread so quickly, which is mental health and uh, economic despair. Because those are the conditions that allow this kind of a crisis to magnify and get out of control as fast as it did. And so you also need a president who's committed to fixing the mental health crisis in this country, where 40 million people self-identify as having a mental illness, and we know the number is much greater than that. We know the number is much greater than that. And we continue to stigmatize mental, mental illness in this country, which is terrible, right? No one should be ashamed of having a mental illness. No family member should be ashamed of a family member that has a mental illness. And until we actually get beyond that stigma, we will not be able to change the health care delivery system so that mental health is treated on par with physical health. Because right now, at least in the U.S. healthcare system generally, mental health claims are four times more likely to get denied than physical health claims. That's because we've allowed this stigma to affect how mental health is delivered. So we have to rebuild our mental health system. And then we have to be creating economic opportunities so that people don't have this kind of economic despair because that contributes to this high unemployment and people not having faith in their future creates the kind of conditions that allow this uh, to happen. So I'm committed as president to not only standing strong against these pharmaceutical companies and make sure they're held responsible and the individual executives in these companies are held responsible, but I'm also for making sure the resources are available to combat this crisis in the communities by funding programs that work. And what works is different in different parts of the country and in different communities. And I'm also committed to ending the mental health crisis in this country and actually doing things to create economic opportunity so we don't have the kind of economic despair that leads to the creation of this.
Uh, Thank you. We're uh, in overtime, so we have to make, uh, we'll have uh, two questions, and uh, you can answer both of them, if you, if you will. Yeah. Uh, Wayne Fredericks and then Larry Wright, and we'll just combine them. So, Wayne. Wopi Latonka, Chante Washte Nape Chuzapo, Washichu Machiapi, Wayne Frederick. I'm a tribal land manager and a political and civil rights organizer, uh, ex elected official. I have a question that uh, you touched on on your platform was tribal, and it's about economic development. Tribal nations are increasingly looking to the future of international trade to grow their economies. As you know, a robust global trade system can be developed to battle the adverse impacts we are currently experiencing as a result of the tariffs. Global trade represents new opportunities for our economies, our youth, and our future. How do we envision the tribes moving forward in the realm of global trade, whether it's in agriculture, electronics, um, or any other number of the industries? What do you see in the future for us, and how do the tribes fit into that global trade plan with our sovereignty? It's a, it, okay, sorry. Associated with that, uh, my question's on broadband. Uh, we're very interested in your broadband access plans. Access to broadband remains a key issue in Indian country, on tribal lands, and particularly in rural areas. Both fixed and mobile broadband is less likely to be available than on non-tribal lands. In many instances, neither Wi-Fi access nor more mobile LTE service are readily available. If either service is available, there are typically fewer carriers than on non-tribal lands. Lack of broadband access contributes to a variety of challenges, whether for students who need to do homework or for workers who need to ensure their skills are competitive and increasingly health care with specifically telehealth opportunities and uh, <clears throat> the global economic arena. So as president, how will you work to bridge the digital divide and bring, and bring broadband access to every corner of Indian country? So I'll start with that and go to trade. So I, I've proposed the largest infrastructure plan of anyone running for president. It's $2 trillion fully paid for, and it includes not just roads and bridges and water systems and energy systems, but it also includes communications, particularly rural broadband. Because you're, if you're a young person in 2019, and you don't have access to high-speed communications, you don't have a shot. Let's face it. And so we have to make sure all communities, in particular rural communities and uh, Native American communities, that young people have access to high-speed communications full stop. And it's been a big priority of mine since I was in Congress. I had the largest bipartisan bill in the Congress, a trillion dollars creating uh, fully paid for, trillion dollars of infrastructure funding, 40 Democrats, 40 Republicans, there was nothing like it. And I've expanded that in my presidential platform to be a $2 trillion platform with an allocation, a specific allocation for communities that are struggling economically. Because New York City can pay for a lot of its infrastructure, as can San Francisco, et cetera. Other communities can't. They should get a disproportionate allocation. So trade. Thank you for the uh, question on trade. So I think the, the Trump's trade war, the president's trade war, is destabilizing the global economy, and it is hurting the United States of America. And in, I hope this doesn't happen, but recent indications uh, point towards us entering into a recession because of it. What the president doesn't understand is that we're in a global economy, and we have to be working with our allies in ensuring the United States is competing as successfully in the global economy and that all of our communities around this country are getting the benefits of being part of the global economy and receiving direct foreign investment. I am the only candidate for president who supports President Obama's effort to enter into the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which I was the point person for him in the House of Representatives when this was when he was trying to get this done in the Congress. And by the way, this was his primary domestic economic priority in his second term. And I think if we would have had the Trans-Pacific Partnership, first of all, every acre of agricultural land in the United States of America would be worth more money today because all crop prices would be higher, because our farmers would have access to markets. And they don't want handouts, they want markets. 
So as president, I plan on getting us back in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but I'm also very mindful that every community benefit from global trade, because historically we haven't seen that. We've seen some communities get completely hollowed out by it, and others benefit enormously. And I think the Native American community and our tribes should have a seat at the table and make sure that U.S. trade policy, which I fully support, again, I'm the, literally the only person running who supports President Obama's signature initiative, which I find, quite frankly, hard to believe, because we see what's happening with this trade war. We see the effect it's having on our communities. But I commit that, that Native American communities will have a seat at the table to make sure U.S. trade policy benefits the United States generally, but benefits all communities specifically, because I think there's unique opportunities for your communities associated with this. So thank you for asking the question. Thanks. Please give a warm thank you to Representative Delaney and our panel. Thank you for having me. And we will be back shortly with the next panel. Thank you. Thank you.